Hey everybody, uh, today I want to look at extensible storage uh, and then I'm going to give you guys a, uh, a module that you can download uh, from my GitHub so you can just go ahead and check that out if you like. I'll show you that um, after I show you a few other things but you can download this like module and it's still I'm still working through it and I'll point out a few things that you'll have to keep in mind when using it. Um, but yeah, feel free to download it. You can find my GitHub uh, below. So extensible storage, what is it? Uh, essentially, it's the ability to store um, information um, about an object or about some other thing that maybe pertains to that object, to that object uh, within the object itself. So there's some information uh, about it on the uh, Autodesk site. And um, it just talks a, a bit about what it is and, and the, um, the values you can store in it. and and different stuff about it so check this out if you want to learn more about it uh, you'll find all of these links below and so it took a bit of research to try to build this in Python uh, in a way that it was reusable uh, for a variety of use cases um, and I'll sh when, like I mentioned before when we get in there I'll show you a few things to keep in mind while I'm still working to make it more flexible but it take it did take a little bit trying to figure that out and so uh here's the revit api documentation on it uh, and there is a sample in here i use this quite a bit uh this is written in c sharp and so i um i use this to try to figure out what to do in, in python and then um i leveraged a lot of other resources so here's like a really old old post a lot of these posts are pretty old here's um um Here's another one um, with uh, Jeremy Tamick, the building co coder, some information. Uh, and then there's some posts on Dynamo, uh, the Dynamo forums, and then Archie Labs or Conrad's uh, stuff. So um, I'll have all of these links below if you want to read more about it and kind of see the resources I was using to try to figure this stuff out. Uh, so feel free to check those out. So what does this look like? Uh, here's the github and it's in this this um, repo right here and then there is a lib folder where I keep all my Python type modules I, I say type module like they're not full-on modules because there's some of them are really messy and I still need to clean them up but ultimately the idea behind these is either for you to load them in as a module and then leverage the functions um, as you see fit or to then or just go into the module and then copy out the code into your own stuff. So um, the one that I've created is uh, here and you can download this right now. You can use it however way you want. And uh, this is what we're trying to do here. Uh, and I actually may need to, to change this around a little bit because I've created a variety of functions that could be used in, in any order. Um, so the first function is a create schema and store data. So that's 2022. You can see right now the inputs are doc and elements. Now the data, the schema name, the field name, all of those are variables we can add to the input of this uh, function so that you can use it uh, as a module inside of your stuff. Uh, so that's kind of the flexibility that I haven't built into it yet, uh, but it's easy easy enough to scroll down and see that, okay, here's my schema name. It's a string. Let me just change that real quick to, to match whatever it is uh, that I'm trying to do. In this case, what I'm doing and what it's built for is to track element locations. And so this could be any element. So maybe it's a view and you want to recognize where that view was and where it is now and then maybe push it back to where it was it could be grids it could be links i mean anything uh, that you want and so i gave it generically this name uh, but at some point I'll, I'll make it a variable that you can easily just pass through uh, and update all instances of it so that 
you can use this for a variety of, of use cases and when you're actually going into this and retrieving the data or looking at it through the Revit lookup, it makes sense. You know, it doesn't just say element location. It may say something else that pertains to actually what's being tracked or what's being embedded in the object. So down here, field builder. So we're tracking the X, Y, Z. Um, we're just adding a simple field. There's like three different options. I haven't looked into all of those, but the simple field allows you to easily just add a, uh, a field. Uh, in this case, just the element location and then just push that data into the model. I won't go through all of this, uh, but there is a Revit 21 version and I need to update this. You can see that's actually, this is a Revit 2020. So I need to update the function name, but um, essentially there's, there's just a syntax change and you can, and you can link in this module and have no issues, uh, no syntax errors or anything. Uh, are no like uh, missing functions between the, the versions. But what you can do is uh, if you're using 2020, you just use the proper function for that um, for that year and you won't have any issues. So, and one of the syntax uh, differences was the field builder. So set unit type. And then if we come up here, You can see here it's uh, set spec, spec type ID. It has something to do with Forge. Um, I haven't dived into that very much, but just keep that in mind. And even between 2019 and 2020, I think there's some differences. Um, so I haven't built all those yet, but just keep that in mind. There also may be an easier way for me to do this. Maybe I create like a, a, um, a super class uh, that the, that Dynamo 20, you know, all the other sub functions inherit from. So they pull in the information, um, you know, the global information or whatever, and then only embed the, um, the functions that uh, specifically deal with the syntax differences. Um, I'm not sure how to write that, but for now, it's just these, they're separated. So anyways, what this does, is it'll create their schema and then uh, the entity and all that and store it into your uh, project. And so if we scroll down, you can see I've got a sample thing here. Again, this is not how this would work. We would want to have a uh, like an input for the actual value and we would be pulling that from the current object in this case, um, the location and then embedding that as the um, location and then in future when things get moved you still have that information in that entity for now i just put a sample to while i was testing it so that'll be updated uh pretty soon but this is where it actually gets set so it adds it what it creates a schema creates the entities creates the fields and it puts it all inside of the object so that's what this function does and then below what we do is we can get the schema from the elements schemas <clears throat> And in this case, what happens is we only return the schema that has um, the name, the proper name in it. So this one, um, and in this case, it's element location. So again, the flexibility part of it is we can build that in as a variable that can easily change. So you put it in one place in the project and then all your other functions use the proper um, schema name so in this case it just looks for that element location now in theory you should only have one of those in the project or sorry that um, are associated with an object and so um, in this case what it does is it grabs it if it finds it then it, it returns the uh, the GUID so the index uh, it reaches in because up here is where we go and get the the uh, uh, the entity schema GUIDs, and that could be ten different GUIDs or or one. It depends on how many schemas are associated with it. Uh, but in here, what we do is we we loop through the names, we try to find the one that matches element location, and then we return that GUID. Uh, now, in theory, there should only be one of these, uh, but that may not be the case, and you can easily change this to grab all instances of a particular uh, entity or whatever, uh, or multiple different names or 
whatever you want. So after we return that, uh, we return the schema. So we grab the schema. That's what's happening here as we're looking it up by the schema GUID. And then we return that. Um, and then down here, we break it. Uh, and then if we don't find any schema, then we return none. Um, then down here, we get value from schema, and this will actually return uh, whatever the value is. And in this case, it's looking for a particular field, which we can edit and, and, and make that a variable that's, uh, that you can change based off of your whatever you're using this for. Um, but this just returns the, the field, so the value, the value of the field. Um, and then down here, it'll return the value, but if it if there is no value, it'll return, uh, there is no schema uh, to get the, the value from. And it'll return that um, into your, if it finds, <clears throat> if it, It'll return that if uh, if this is the way that you use it, if there's nothing in there. Uh, and then down here, though, if, say, you're not wanting to get the value and you want to delete the schema, maybe you used it for the purpose and now you want to clean it up. So you grab all the elements and now you want to delete it. Well, same thing, though, like we uh, did up here, is, um, is if there is nothing, in, if there's no schema that matches that name, then we return... Um, uh, there is no schema to delete. And then if there is, then we delete the schema. So schema is deleted, or schema deleted. And then the output for this particular, uh, well, so this would be a module. This out, out for the actual Python node uh, wouldn't be inside of the module. So that would, you would do, you would create whatever you want there. Same for here. Um, so here we're getting the schema from the element. And then that's when we use it in whatever function, get value or delete uh, schema from element. Anyways, that's the breakdown of this. It might be too much detail. Um, like I say in all my other videos, if this is something you want to learn, feel free to download it, use it, play with it, treat it you know, as, it, as your own and um, uh, just investigate it that way. That's a great way of uh, just trying to figure out how to, to use this stuff. So anyways, um, it's available. You can find it below in my, uh, uh, there's a GitHub link and then uh, just check it out. And let me know if you have any issues or questions. So real quick, just to show you what that actually looks like inside of an object. So we've got a wall here. And if I go to the add-ins tab, Revit Lookup, definitely recommend getting this add-in if you don't have it already. And then uh, Snoop Current Selection, we grab that. Uh, that. We can see here, we're looking at that wall. Scroll down, you can see all of these entities that I've added. Now, some of these don't have uh, access. So you can set like read access write access when you're creating the schema. So you can see here, these ones um, actually don't know. I, I would imagine that we don't have access or read access and that's what's going on here. Um, but uh, I've noticed that regardless on the model, there seems to always be uh, two of these in here. I haven't looked into this, one or two of these in there. Uh, but also, um, I think you, you can set like access levels to your own entities as well. So anyways, you can see here I was testing a lot. If we grab that, uh, you can come down here and see that there's element location and then you can see zero, zero, zero. Now, um, I think this one is the same, yep. So if we look at this uh, wall, back to add-ins, snoop current selection. If we scroll down, we'll see, and this would be like the perfect scenario we have just one entity we look at that we say okay there's the location for that wall we fix it or we move whatever this element is to the the right location and then we purge that entity out of the object if we need to um so i don't know if i mentioned this at the beginning but if you dig into this you'll figure out pretty quickly that these entities live with the object so it's a part of the revit database so when you're done with this uh, model and you know you're still going to use that that information at some point, there's no need to embed it into a text file or some other 
um, you know, storage, like a database, you can just sync your model or save it. And then when you get back into it again, that information is still embedded in, in those objects. So the typical process, I think, or the, I haven't seen this yet, uh, a real example of this, but add-ins and stuff will use that extensible storage to store information. And for the most part, I think they shouldn't be using a ton of data. It should be very small uh, for an entire uh, project. It shouldn't be more than a, a few megs. But um, yeah, I haven't seen an instance of an, an add-in doing that yet. Uh, other than the few that you've saw um, right there. And I can't say much about these. These look like they're uh, the family browser status and then the, the stacked wall uh, member IDs. They, it looks like that's something that's built into Revit already. And so I don't know about, like, you know, there's a Torque add-in or uh, like the Bim Beats. I don't think they embed anything, but you may find that third-party add-ins that you use and at, go in there and write information uh, into certain objects. So anyways... That's all I got. Something I just wanted to mention real quick, though, is that um, I've got a, a video next week, and I'll be posting a kind of an announcement, or not much of an announcement, just a heads up, like I'm, I'm going to be talking about this next week. But I'm going to be looking into Toric. They were nice enough to give me a license to the tool so that I can do some testing in it. And so I want to share what I find uh, in that tool. Uh, I think it's a really powerful tool in the way that it allows you to, uh, it lowers the barrier to get into uh, data and really trying to leverage it to make decisions. Uh, and, and what's cool about that is it supports a data culture, uh, people really uh, being empowered to uh, use information to make decisions, being empowered to actually drive that kind of change. Um, to be able to dig into their own models and build their own workflows. They make it really easy, and that's why um, I think it's a wonderful tool, uh, you know, because it opens it up to anybody. You don't have to sit down and learn how to uh, develop stuff in Python, um, which is uh, very complex if you want to make a, a nice dashboard. I would even say it's it's easier than using uh, Power BI. Um uh, so anyways, that will be next week tomorrow, or actually the day that this video comes out is when I'll, I'll now, I'll just mention it on LinkedIn. Uh, but yeah, that's, and you'll find a link below to their site. So check that out if you, uh, if you want, but anyways, that should be exciting. I think a combination of looking into that and BIM beats and really seeing all this data and what we have access to. I mean, there's all these new tools now um, that are tracking and, and, and giving you the ability to really look at the information you're generating. Uh, and it's really cool. And I just love the low barrier tools. You know, I'm a fan of coding, but it's not something that I think everybody's required to do, especially with these low code or no code platforms. I think it opens it up to where everybody can get into it. And because it's just not feasible to say, oh, a firm of any size, everybody's going to learn Python. That's just not going to happen. Uh, and I think it's powerful to have a variety of folks getting into these tools uh, and actually using them um, uh, in, in their different ways, you know, either that through Toric or through Power BI or through Python, or maybe it's through a SQL server um, or a SQL database these things are, um, by allowing that flexibility, I think it opens it up to a bigger, you know, it, it really creates that culture. I think the data culture, really focusing on data. But anyways, enough of that. I will release that next week. Um, check it out. But anyways, thanks a lot for watching. Hopefully you found this helpful. I will see you guys in the next video.